Welcome to the They Enjoy Each Other Hour. <laughs> That's a Facts. good one. It is a good one. Yeah, it just came to my mind as I said hello. Dennis and Julie, Dennis Prager, Julie Hartman. But that would be if just as, uh, you, well, there's no such thing. Dennis and Julie can't get more accurate than that, but they enjoy each other. I know that we've... By the way, it's amazing. That's a topic unto itself. Do you know that I don't ask couples... Tell me if I've said this on Dennis and Julie, because you're like a oh, living... Know. You're, I know. You're a living... Not thesaurus. Recording but, machine. Yeah. I don't ask a young couple, do you, do you love each other? So they're planning to marry. So, you, you know, if, if they're they're asking for advice or opening up to me, either one or both. So I don't ask, uh, do you love each other? I, I assume the answer is yes. I, I, so I don't even ask that. I ask a, a more important question. You know what it is? Do you enjoy each other? Yeah. And you can really tell if a couple does and if they don't. It's very apparent, I You can I think. easily love each, uh, another person but not enjoy them. Hmm. In the long run, my sense is, and, and I've had long runs, <laughs> my, I, I would say that you enjoy each other is ultimately even a greater predictor of marital joy than do you love each other. I can't imagine... Uh, I can imagine people who love each other and don't enjoy each other more than I can imagine people enjoying each other and not loving each other. I, if I'm thinking about all the people who I love, I think I enjoy all of them too. And I think... Well, that's so that's interesting. If that's true, I think you're in the minority. I don't know how many... Well, yeah, people, I, I can actually think of some examples. No, well, I don't know how many people enjoy their parents. Many people love their parents. Not everybody does even that, but that we'll right. put that aside. I don't know how many people enjoy their parents. I'm not. I'm not certain that that's what parents are there for. They're there. They're they're there for love, security, continuity, a whole bunch of things. I hope my kids enjoy me. I really do. I, and I, I try to make myself enjoy a bull. But I, I don't know that, that that's the norm. Do you enjoy your parents? Yeah, ask your friends that. Hmm. Uh, it would be very interesting to, if people were honest, if they would answer that. Well, I think if your parents are good parents, there are going to be periods of life where you certainly don't enjoy them. If your parents are your best friends, that's a problem. Yeah. There, I, I, in general, very much enjoy my parents. I love them, but there have certainly been times when I haven't. But that's because they've disciplined me, or they've, you know, tried to do what's what's best for me. I'm trying to think about. So, growing up, that would not have been my the way I would have described my parents. So, once I was an adult, yeah, I, I would say. What my parents did for me once I was an adult was better than mm. than you know already. What, what are you thinking? Was better than if they had just showered you with love and adoration. Mm. Oh, clearly. But uh, when I, th 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 absolutely correct. But what I was thinking, there was something even better. This is going to sound, I, I think it's going to sound a little awful. It's it's it. The last thing in my mind is to make it sound awful, but I'm but I want to. I, I will be open. The thing they did for me that is even perhaps better, or or tied with, do you enjoy them? Was they presented me with no problems. I would say. That's that's even like a step below enjoy, <laughs> and yet it's so important. Mm -hmm. F kids who do not present problems to parents, and I, I don't mean this when they're 16, that's almost inevitable, 
but when they're grown up, okay, 25 up, let's say, if parents are very lucky if their child presents no issues to them, and likewise, children are very lucky if their parents don't present problems to them. Well, this harkens back to something that you said to me off the air, and it stuck with me. You said that you endeavor to be an easy That's right. presence yes. in people's oh, yeah. lives. I, I love that you remember and that. And I thought yes. that actually... Easy is a great goal. The thing about you that a lot of people wouldn't... Or maybe maybe your your listeners would get this, but, but it's hard to, to get it unless you know you. People would think that the main utility of having someone like Dennis Prager in your life is that he's so wise and he's so intellectual and there's so much that he can teach you. And all of, all of that is certainly true. I'm the beneficiary of all of those things. But above all else, you're really easy. I have rarely, if ever, seen you be ornery or sassy or, uh, you know, I, I said this to you a few weeks ago. I said, you know, you've, you've done so much for me and uh, you know, intellectually, professionally. I mean, you you were so nice to give me the chance to come onto your radio show weekly that that one summer. That was a big risk that you were taking. And you could really hold that over me. You know, you could you could say, you know, I really I helped you break out into radio. Can you do this for me? Can you, you know, defend me publicly and this, you know, when people are mad at me about this or that, but you've never done that. Ever. And I know that it comes back to the fact that you you endeavor to be an easy presence and that's why when you said a few moments ago that you hope that your kids enjoy you i know that they do in large part because you're very easy good i i i hope i'm easy i i think i'm i'm trying to be easy you you are easy that's right and 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 it's interesting i think you work at it i do work at it well, the the thing the re- is, for, let me just tell you, you'll, you sh- I'm interrupting you, but you'll no, you'll, I, you'll appreciate okay, why. Go ahead. Why do I say that? I mean, isn't that interesting that I did say that? You work at it more than I work at it. That's my that's I work at it. I'm very conscious of of being easy in people's lives. But you do. The reason I said that was because you. Don't fall asleep quickly. Therefore, I knew you were going to say this. You did? Yes. Well, not not the fall asleep, but I, I knew you, you were going to say that I ruminate and I'm very yes, hard on myself, yes. and that's what contributes to it. Right. In other words, you have a bigger battle. Yes, definitely. It, <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it mildly. <laughs> By the way, I just looked at myself on the screen. I'm, I'm, uh-huh. I'm matching the colors today. This is a very Dennis and Julie dress that I'm wearing. Oh, this is a Dennis and Julie It is, shirt. actually. It really is it because is. it's blue I mean, the, and, and black uh, striped. Oh, then it's unbelievable. Uncanny. We didn't even plan it. Uh, we lo- never planned anything. The Lord anything. is at work. But I, yeah. y- you know, I'm really trying to work on this pattern of thought that I have. I'm, I'm relentlessly self-critical. And I've talked about this on the show before. It comes from the fact that as as a as a complimentary to myself as this may sound, in order to achieve what I achieved in athletics, in school, in college admissions, even on, you know, career wise, I my my way of doing that was to convince myself that I was just barely skating by. And that if I didn't keep up my relentless work then all of it was going to go away. Even when I won swimming races, I would I would think like, well, you you just got lucky today. Like all everyone else was tired or I, I would convince myself that it, there was I was just hanging by a thread. But that now I've so internalized those thoughts that I don't ever think I've done anything good or anything extraordinary or worthy of praise. I just think I've done the bare minimum. But anyway, that's just to say you're right that this is something that I work on because although I think and I hope when I'm interacting with people I'm easy, I sometimes my self uh, doubt and my uh, criticisms of myself I think kind of comes out and people can sense it. And in that way, maybe oh, I'm not the easiest. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I, I just know because we're very open with each other. So I, I know. I mean, how would I know? 
that you don't fall asleep quickly. Right, but but why did you say that's evidence for how I work on being because easy? Because it means that you're you you don't have you have an easy life in terms of creature comforts and security, you know, financial security, right. etc. But you don't have an easy life internally. Your internal life doesn't strike me as easy. All of this self-criticism, all, all, all of the ruminating that keeps you up at night, I don't have that. I know. Well, you, so do you... <laughs> I'm not even asking the question. It's a stupid question. I was going to say, do you think you're the norm? But the answer is, of course, you're not the norm. You're the exception. I think the vast majority of people are far more like me than they are like you. I agree with you. So how do do you attribute this to your nature? Yes. Or do you attribute it to working? Because I, uh, I've yeah. even seen the ways that I am starting to overcome this. I mean, two years ago, right. I was way worse than no, I am now. I, 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 both are true, but let me tell you something. It's hard for me to believe we haven't discussed this, but it doesn't matter. It's so important. Every human being has two natures. By the way, this is only, this is a realization that I, that's been very recent in my life, even though it's so obvious, I should have known this 40 years ago, but I didn't. There are literally, everyone has two natures, human nature, this, which everybody has. There's such a thing as human nature. And uh, the, everyone has battles with human nature, envy, selfishness, greed, you, you name it. Every, everybody has uh, some, some battles with their human nature. But everybody has battles or, and blessings mm-hmm. with their unique nature. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's the point. Yeah. That so... I wonder, because I was not I was not a particularly happy uh, child prior to the age of fourteen. I know, and and uh, I at times very unhappy, and I know that I consciously pursued happiness. I know this once I was in high school. I mean, it it, it be, but on the other hand, what I do think now is. I battled to let my real nature, which is happy, come out. Mm -hmm. Well, so (laughs) this is a nice segue because I wanted to tell the audience a bit about my interaction with your grandson, Jack. And he is just the most naturally happy, such a character. Yeah. Like he really like... If you ever wanted to make oodles of money, which I know is not your principal concern right. as it is values, but if you ever wanted to make oodles of money, literally just get a camera crew and follow him around and put it on the internet and call it like a day in the life of Jack Prager. It is so, he is so funny. But he, I'll tell the story about him, but just to kind of finish with this conversation or do add a point, I used to be like that when I was young. I was so carefree and a character and I actually believe it or not I was kind of the class clown when I was younger and I had to be disciplined by teachers to stop being rowdy I mean I wasn't I wasn't like a a, troublemaker a troublemaker yeah I understand but I was I remember you know I I I was just loud and funny and I loved entertaining people when when I was young people thought I was going to be a comedian but then as I got older by the way I feel like it's I'm making my sound myself sound like a deeply unhappy tortured person i'm not do i struggle right. with self-doubt and self-criticism right. Right. yes but i'm able to have fun and i i would consider myself actually to be a very happy person overall but as i got older and i've seen this happen to different people too especially in the kind of in schools that i went to which were all about you know discipline and achievement i kind of had that knocked out of me and i so focused on being you know, the straight A student and the person who is beloved by every teacher and the the best performer and the best everything. And I look back and interestingly, now we live in a world where people could use a lot more discipline and a lot more seriousness in school. But I look back and I sort of wonder which would have benefited me more. Obviously, there needs to be a balance, but sometimes I think maybe in the long term in life, it may have benefited me more had I held on more to the crazy kooky character than to the perfect. It's been you know, very hard for me not, not to say anything because I. I... 
Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. I'm debating either whether to say it because it's not my life, but I, I don't I don't think that I'm, uh, uh, I'm betraying a confidence. So I have an older brother who's extremely successful like you. Mm-hmm. The same Harvard stuff as well. I mean, truly, and sports stuff. He was captain of the basketball team and... Ended up at Harvard Medical School, so it's a very. I, I am, I I am close and have been my whole life to a person very similar to you in, in these ways. I have seen movies. They're they're silent because they're from you know the old age. I don't know my but my dad, to his credit, loved technology, so he always had the, the latest whatever invention was. And he actually has color movies of uh, much more of my brother. Once I came around, he was pretty bored <laughs> with taking movies of a child. Whatever you have, you should publish. I, I, I agree with you. But the, the, the point I'm making is a very serious one. When I look at my brother in those movies of, of him in, in, up through high school, before college, you have a happy-go-lucky character just performing almost before the camera. And then in college, he became truly Mr. Serious. Mm. And that has sort of personified his personality ever since. And uh, he was driven to to... Uh, the the success you were driven to academic and and all other uh, and I wasn't uh, I you were kind of the cl- not not yeah the class no 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 class, that's oh were, yes uh, you I retained took the other route. I retained the lightheartedness right because I didn't I didn't pursue the, here's an interest I don't know if I've shared this with you I I don't think I've shared it on Dennis and Julie. So this, I, I'm sure I've made some reference to, that I did no work in high school. I mean, literally no work. I, I, I didn't do one homework in four years. I had the exact same notebook for four years. I was terribly proud of that fact, that I had filled it with nothing. I mean, I don't even know if a kid could get away with it today, what I did. No homework, no, no work. I studied for exams in order to pass them. I didn't, I didn't give a damn what grades I got, and I ended up in the bottom 20% or upper 80%, as I like to say it, of my graduating class. I thank God every, I don't know, I can't say every day, but very frequently, that I allowed myself a lighthearted youth. Mm-hmm. Because, and I know I've said this to you privately, but I don't think I've mentioned this on on our uh, podcast. I I don't even come close to burnout. Yeah. At at my age. It's a real problem. Yes, it's a very real problem. Did I tell you the story of the woman I sat next to on an airplane talking? Oh, with the, the son. Yeah, who was in yes. Harvard Medical School, yes. as it you turns out. you told on Dennis and Julie. But yes. Like, but you know what? I listened to Dennis and Julie the other day, and sometimes when we both know a story, you go, have I told it? And I go, yes, and then we move on. And I can imagine the listener gets sometimes like... Annoyed. Annoyed. So let's... So do you want me to synopsize it, or you synopsize it? Yeah, I could do it we so fast. We need to fast. work on that. I was just... <laughs> no, no, 
on work on what? We need to work on not just communicating, you know, like if we both know the story moving on. We need to tell the story. Again. Yes. Oh, I yeah. think. Yeah, I of course I agree. Who remembers it? I don't re- exact I I I'm super worried about oh well I bore people if I they I heard know, the story. I know I do too, but we but, but we it, can be quick. It, it, it's it, it's silly cuz I'm totally happy to hear uh, if I enjoy someone, I'm totally happy to hear a, a story the second or eighth time. Anyway, to make, very quickly, I'm sitting next to a woman on a plane, and she's, I, I couldn't help, she's, before we took off, she's talking, and literally says, you, oh, you're suffering burnout, and uh, you want to leave. talking to her son. Yes, to her son. You want to leave school, and, and so I, how could I not hear her conversation? So I said when she hung up, I said, I'm so sorry. May I ask what this is about? He said, yes, my son is at Harvard Medical School. From the earliest age, he was an incredibly determined student to get A's, got into Harvard, and now he now he's totally burned out. And all I thought was, thank you, God. I, I, I will never burn out. I knew it. But here's the thing, Dennis. You were an extraordinary kid and that in lieu of That's working, right. you went yes. to or, you know symphonies, you learned yeah. Russian. Oh, I told myself you, to conduct orchestras, yes. thought myself and right. I agree with you. A lot of kids, I mean, yeah, you're, no, they'll you're be, the exception. They'll, you're they'll right. get into gangs, they'll get into drugs, or, they'll get into video, video games, games or yes, pornography. That's, that's, that's right. And so I have a lot of respect that for the for the tough position that parents are in where they need to, you know. Right. If your kid doesn't want to do schoolwork, they have to do something else right that's productive but that's that's the key to every parent listening but your point about the lightheartedness like maintaining it i i think that is so true and i i can't tell you how many people i've seen lose who it lose it and to an extent i lost that's it but right. i'm getting it that, you know i'm getting it back yes and and it was yeah, it right. didn't totally die i actually it's funny because yeah. I, I think more off camera it comes out than on camera, which I'm trying to, to right. work on. Yes. Um, not not that I'm fake on camera. I think I just no, go no, more no. towards I, the no, serious side. I told you the hardest thing I had to teach myself when I began radio was to be myself. And it's very unnatural to, or it's it's hard to you know stare at a camera, especially when I'm alone on my show, and yeah. then make a joke to the camera. Like you don't have anybody to yes, play off of. Right. But but anyway, I I have seen so many people who were these joyful, lighthearted full of spirit, full of energy, full of personality, kids or adolescents. And then you encounter them later and they, and and look, I understand this may be specific to the environments that I was in. Again, I am keenly aware that now there's kind of been this pendulum swing where in a lot of schools, there's no discipline and, and people are just cast out adrift, which is his own problem. But I've seen people just become robots and hollow human beings. It was really sad actually. So at at my high school, we had this program where we were junior advisors when we were uh, in 11th grade to eighth graders. And every single day uh, when I was there, you'd have an advisory program. And you, as an 11th grader, would be assigned to a group of 10 eighth graders. And every morning you'd go in and kind of be their advisor and talk about their day with them and be kind of a mentor. And I loved that. I love being a mentor, being a leader. And it was so fun. And I was best friends with all these eighth grade girls at my school. And they'd see me in the hallway. And, and I took so much joy in them. And I think and hope they took so much joy in me. And a few years ago, like two years ago, I ran into one of them on the street. And she was like, oh my God, Julie. And I, and I you know, was, we were so happy to see each other. And I remembered her as so funny and goofy and irreverent and not to an absurd extent, but just like sunshine. And she was like, you could just tell in her face, or as they would say in 19th century literature, countenance. That's a word they use a lot. And I love that word. You could see in her countenance, there was just this like gloom. And she had, and she was like, I'm. She was in eleventh or twelfth grade, and she's like, Yeah, I'm in the middle of college apps, and I'm in the middle, you know, of taking the SAT, and and it was just like, and I actually. What happened? I think she got the life kicked out of her. I think she was so focused on getting into college, so focused on getting good, and I get it, you know, that she just the it was like a, kind of a soul suck, and it and I and I pulled her aside, and I hope this wasn't heavy handed, but I just said. I remember you as the most spirited person. Don't lose that. Hold on to that girl. 
remember who she was go back to her don't lose that and she re- and she she was kind of startled that i said it but i think it meant a lot to her where where did she end up in college i don't know if i should say i don't okay a, a very good college okay, but I just, prestigious there are yeah, very I don't few wanna, good colleges you at all reveal one. So you're the one who actually pointed out to, to me, you, you have made a very eloquent case about how the life can get kicked out of you. When so much goes into you, the resume, when you're pursuing not the, much re, else the goes resume. into the person. Yeah, that was, a, was an insight from you. I mean, I, I had never articulated it that way. I knew it in high school. That's why I said I, 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 I didn't give a damn where I went to college. Right. Uh, but... Uh, so do you know Freud makes this, Freud who I th- was a genius in my opinion, even though he's, he's ignored today, but he, he made the point, I think in civilization and it's discontent, but I'm not, not certain, but he made the point, civilization is built on self-suppression. Ooh, interesting. Oh, I, I love when you love a point because it's such... Well, it's, it's, like, it's like eating candy. It's, it's like so, eating wow. candy, yes. And he is so right. If we, yeah. if we do what we want to do, civilization would never have been built. Civiliz- that is why he believes, if I'm, I hope I'm getting him right, neurosis is a product of civilization. Hmm. And... Uh, now, psychosis is a separate issue. That's, you know, that's... That's, that's so that's, true. That that civilization is the suppression of instinct. Yes. We have We have the instinct to steal. We have the instinct to so, be see, anarchist. We have I was to just, be polygamous. I, that, right. Oh, perfect. The last one's perfect. Cause I was just reading an article, needless to say, the New York Times. It was celebratory of polyamory. Oh, I saw Cu- that one. You did? Yes, I Cu- did. Couples who... Uh, what is the word? Uh, have open marriages. Open marriages, yeah. I was just reading and, that this morning. And so you don't you don't build a civilization on people screwing around. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. You also don't pil- build a civilization on 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 sick sexual repression. There there is a middle road. I th- I think America. I I really do believe America pursued a great middle road. Where, where there was a big belief in, in monogamy, there was a big belief in marriage, there was a big belief in fidelity, uh, there was a, you know, a big condemnation of, of, uh, of adultery, but there was also a real freedom. You know, women did not wear big cover-ups. You know, my, my parents, Orthodox Jews, would watch the Miss America contest and, and watch them... Uh, all model in in swimsuits and talk to each other. So Hill, my that's my my father would call my mother Hill. Her name was Hilda. So Hill, what, what do you think of you know Miss uh, Miss Montana, huh? Not pretty pretty good, huh? And she go, I, I don't know. I thought Miss Oklahoma was was cuter. They and and here they were, you know, faithful, married sixty nine years together, seventy two years, uh, seventy three years. So do, do you get my point? The the Civilization is built. Mm-hmm. The primitive society did not have curbs like this. Uh, th- this notion, you know, free love and all of this stuff, for forgetting the morality of, of religious ethics, just in terms of building civilization. Civilization is built on a certain suppression of human nature. It is just the way it works. And people don't think in terms of building a civilization. No, they, they don't. only think in terms of advancing right. themselves and their families. Self realization. And that's the thing. Like, I, I wasn't really aware of this in, until recently. Like, we are in a moment in time right now. There are people who came before us, and there are people who, go, who are going to come after us. And the question that I am fascinated by is are we fulfilling our responsibilities to both parties? Are we fulfilling our responsibilities to the people who have built this for us? And are we fulfilling our responsibilities to the people who we're going to pass civilization on to next? But we we are not taught to think in those terms. Again, I'm not wagging the finger. I didn't really think in those terms until recently. But the, the people who I go back to, and I, 
they're it's so funny with so much in my life I would I think about how the old me would react to me saying this now the old me when I was learning about the colonial period in America the first settlers the first colonies I thought that was the most oppressively boring thing in the world Hmm. and now I think it's riveting I read Paul Johnson's uh, History of the American People, which, by the way, everyone should read. It's, it's, it is a thousand pages, and I know people are like hearing that and they're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. But it's actually quite concise because he goes from the first right. colony, yes. which actually wasn't Jamestown. It was in, I think, like North Dakota, and it failed in, in the late 1500s. Really? Yeah. There was North a first, Dakota? I don't know if it's exactly. No, at, I, I, wait, did I say North Dakota? Yeah, yeah, I'm that's, sorry. That's way too I'm inland. sorry. Yeah. North Carolina. Okay. I'm so sorry. Clearly, I'm a fool. Um, but okay. He, see, by the way, folks, I'm looking in the camera. Well, that was really dumb. Clearly, I'm well, a fool. Well, North Dakota is nowhere she close to the. She made a mistake, and clearly, yeah, she's but that a was. Fool. There are many good reasons to buy gold and silver. Bank failures, digital currency volatility, emerging market countries trying to topple the dollar as a global reserve currency. Julie Hartman here for Amfed Coin and Bullion, Dennis's choice for buying precious metals. If you ask Amfed owner Nick Grovich to simplify the case for precious metals, he'll tell you when President Roosevelt recalled the gold in circulation and paid people with paper money, they received a $20 bill for a $20 gold piece. Today, that $20 bill won't even fill half of your gas tank. But the gold piece is worth about $2,000. Which would you rather own? Now, let's simplify the reasons to use Amped coin in bullion. Nick's been in the industry for over 42 years, and he's proud of providing transparency and fair pricing to build trusted relationships. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick and his team at Amped coin and bullion 1-800-221-7694, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. Okay. It's pretty stupid. Okay, anyway, whatever. So, he, it's okay, whatever. <laughs> All right. it, he goes from the end of the the 16th century to ki- the 1980s basically. And it's it's concise and he and he gives you only the most important information. It's a great book. But anyway, the first chapter is about the colonial period and i remember reading that and i thought oh god julie you're gonna have to slog through this one you know it's just something that you should know as a commentator as an american citizen and that was my favorite chapter of all because i was humbled by the the these individuals yep. purpose beyond themselves i mean can you imagine you are in england now now of course they they were persecuted but they weren't persecuted so heavily that they had to leave these were people who puritans who were trying to get away from the anglican church the church of england because they thought the church of england was too much resembled the catholic church and anyway that doesn't matter but the point is it's not like they were you know jewish minorities living in a muslim majority it wasn't so bad that they had to move but they thought about they didn't think about themselves at all they thought about posterity and 102 people got on the Mayflower. They went on a terribly difficult journey of several months in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in a wooden boat. People died. They had to throw the bodies overboard. People got diseases. They got seasick. They got Babies were born. I mean, it was just like, can you imagine how terrifying it was to be on that? They get to a new land. There are Native Americans there who are g- trying to kill them. They're in a new environment. The winter is hard, and they literally have to build a civilization. And half of the first settlers died in the first winter. But you know what they did? They they had such a remarkable view of building civilization that they persevered through it. And they got married and they had kids, not for themselves, but for civilization. Can you imagine, like, what kind of, do those people exist today? Hmm. They, you know, another thing I think about is all the Americans who went to war in World War II to defend our freedoms and to defend people across the world who we didn't know and didn't have a connection to to try to save them. Do we have people now in society who believe so much in something beyond themselves that they would do a similar thing? I don't think that we do. But anyway, that's just to say that we have come from people who only thought about how to advance civilization. And now we are rewarding those people by not thinking at all about how to advance civilization, only to enrich ourselves. 
What is the statement? We're living on the fumes? I, that's what I say, yes. We're living on the, the dregs and the fumes of Judeo-Christian values. Mm-hmm. So can I tell about Jack? Unless you Yo, have no, point. please, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting how we, t- we got the... We got from the lightheartedness, and then you said civilization is built on the suppression of right. instincts. Mm-hmm. But but the point is you you want to maintain some good yeah, right, of instincts. Course, right. So Jack Prager, eight years old, Dennis's grandson, and you have another grandson who's who is remarkable. Really, he, he's a wonderful. He's thirteen years old, Daniel, and he's so loving um, to his to his brother. But Jack is a hoot. So. Jack was on Dennis's radio show recently, and you were quizzing him on capitals, right? right. And he got most of them except for Idaho. Uh, and so after the show, we were just chatting, <laughs> and I and you said that you also asked him, Jack, what do you want to be when you grow up? On the air. On the air. Yeah. And so we're off the air at this point, and I'm saying, Oh, Jack, what what did you say? And he said, Well, I said I wanted to be a soccer player, but then he turns to Dennis and he turns and he goes, But Poppy. I'm really, I'm going to have to find a team that will allow me to not play on Shabbat. He's eight. Like, who who says that at eight years old? Because obviously he's Jewish. Or do they grow up Orthodox yeah, Jewish? Yeah, yeah. And he wears a kippah. He's, mm-hmm. he's very cute. And he goes, I-, I think there were some baseball players in the past who, who didn't play on Shabbat. I, I hope I'll-, I'll be able to find a team that will allow me to you know rest Oof. on the Sabbath. I'm like, I love you. It was so cute. And then I said to him, Jack, what's your favorite part about Judaism? And he says, um, I think I would say Shabbat or praying to Hashem. Which is Hebrew, God, Hebrew for which God. Which is praying for God. An eight-year-old, like, no sarcasm, totally genuine, praying and, and, to Hashem. And, and, he, it's not, and, and he's not what people would think, you know, some religiously repressed kid. No, no, he's like he's, running he's, around yeah, he, and he's, he's, he's so... He's wild. Yes. He's a character. He is. And and then I said, uh, what do you pray to Hashem about? And he goes, to thank him for things. And I said, like what? And he goes, well, recently I thanked him for the rain. <laughs> and I said, why? And he points to the bag of chips that we have over there on the shelf you can't see it on camera in the office and he points and he goes you know poppy these chips wouldn't exist if it weren't for rain (laughs) like what kid speaks like that and again like some some people may think like he was trying to put on an act to be no it was the most genuine and i just looked at him and i thought you are so not jaded you're so pure and you're so lighthearted and you're happy but but it's it's a, a a great combination because he's joyful, lighthearted, and happy, but it's coupled with clearly great values and principles. Mm-hmm. And I've just very rarely seen such a, a lovely coming together of those two things. You think of them as being incompatible, right? You think the people with the good values would be the stern and the strict ones so and the lighthearted ones would be bandits. I always tell people the first thing I note in most homeschooled kids is that they're not jaded. Mm-hmm. Religion, and most of these kids have some religion in their lives, the, of the homeschool kids. Religion protects you from cynicism. And so we were talking about how I observed in my environments where everyone was so focused on achievement that people lost their lightheartedness. And I said it was kind of like a soul suck. And I've, I also said I acknowledge that that may be very specific to, to the environment that I was in. But we see this in a lot of different ways, too. Like that, for instance, recently on Timeless, I was talking about why I deleted my personal social media account. And one of the things that I was saying was that so many people become jaded and on social media and they put so much into their social medias that there's not much left in who they are. Yep. It's sort of my resume. There's right. so much in the resume. There's not much in the person, but applied to social media. That on social media, you're so desperately trying to trumpet who you are instead of actually figuring out and being who you are. I'll, and I think politics has a similar thing. You can have your soul sucked out of you if you're in high school and you're focused too much on getting into college. You can have your soul sucked out of you if you're too focused on social media. But now we see these curriculums that are so like shoving politics down people's throats. And I think that is another way of kind of deadening and suppressing the lighthearted, joyful 
nuanced parts of people's personalities. Like here in California, they just passed this truly. Well, how, how, forgive me, no, but go how, ahead. how do you go to uh, what is it, drag queen story hour at six years of age and not get jaded? Isn't that the ultimate jaded? A, I, a guy parading around in, in women's clothing? I mean, I exposed a ninth grade California public high school curriculum on my show that a listener sent to me and said, please show this. And the, all the slides are about trigger warnings and about intersectionality and, intersectionality and about privileged and oppressors and oppressed. There's an Illinois school district I also exposed on my show who teaches preschoolers what non-binaryism is. And then by kindergarten, they have to be fluent in what transgenderism is. Mm -hmm. And then by eighth grade, they have to be able to demonstrate that they uh, have tools to combat heteronormativity. I mean, it's like, and you, I'm sure these kids are going to these schools and like, they're whole they're being bombarded with this confusion and this these like draconian like society is heteronormative and you need to you know unravel your heteronormative you know inclination it's like this is not what kids should be exposed to e even here in California there's this law that was passed by the truly sick governor that we have Gavin Newsom that uh, department stores with over 500 mm -hmm. employees have to sell gender neutral toys or have a gender neutral toy section or they'll be fined hundreds of dollars. You can't just have boys and girls toys. I think that's bad because of government intervention and private businesses and the distortion of discrimination law. But, but also if you're a kid and you're like five years old and you're going into a toy store, mm -hmm. you're not thinking, oh my God, there's a boy section and there's a girl section. You're just a kid going in to buy toys, you know? And like everywhere these people turn, there are these political messages that they're being bombarded with. And then yep. they start to think that the that politics has an outsized influence in their lives when it doesn't. Yep. That's why I say what I say about the homeschool kids. The jaded is the most obvious. And you're right, Jack is not jaded. Do you fear that as they get older? No, they might no. Be? Why? Be because. And why do you think religion is the antidote? We're talking about all of these things that contribute to the jadedness. Why Why does religion not? Well, when you're their age, it's a buffer between you and society. I mean, just very specifically, religious kids don't have drag queens in their lives. I mean, think of the things that do tear you away from non-jadedness, from a a happy-go-lucky view of life. What a jaded is, is you're coarsened. A jaded kid isn't going to go, "Wow, what a gorgeous sunset!" Right? A jaded, a jaded kid is not going to say that. It and it we're 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 so jaded that there are a lot of adults listening who might even think, "I want a kid who goes, what a gorgeous sunset," and the answer is yes. Not only you that, do. you want an adult who says, what a gorgeous sunset. But it, it, anyway, religion, it doesn't allow you the things that rob you, this from you. That's, that's not the only reason, but that is a big reason. They will not have drag queen story hour, religious kids in religious schools, Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. I mean, they're just not going to have it. So that protects them. Second, they they know that there is something else to life. And, yes. and that's big. Oh, it's ever I think it's everything. Okay, it might be everything. That you know, there's God, there's Bible and that's that's a big protector. It's, it did with me. I I was not jaded. Uh, I I was bushy-tailed or whatever, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed about life. Uh, with, with I wasn't a happy kid, but I wasn't a jaded kid. Mm -hmm. Talking about very young, because starting teens, I got quite happy starting at 14. And and the religion was a huge factor uh, in, in all of this. You march to the beat of a different drummer if you're a religious kid. People... Pe you know that I, I read on my radio show, you will love this. Oh, this will be, you'll probably want to do a, a timeless on this. So Pew, which is not 
liberal, not conservative. It, it I probably, really like Pew, I got to say. Yes, Pew is a serious research institute that does polling in a very serious way. So according to the latest report, this was in NPR, which is left wing. Okay, so just want people to understand. I didn't get this from some right wing source. National Public Radio. According to Pew, the largest single group, religiously speaking, today for the first time in American history is nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people oh. who have no religion. <laughs> it's like nuns. Nice. I know. That's why I, I spell it. <laughs> they have People who have no religion. Yeah. So, so I think it goes like 29% no, no religion, Catholics and, and evangelicals split 25 or so each, each way. And, uh, and uh, so what is that, 30, 55, uh, 80, so that the other 20% is scattered among a whole bunch of other groups. So th- most people don't read whole articles. I do because of my fourth paragraph from the bottom Prager theory of articles Ooh, that's you will good. That's find good. the gems at the end that's good and you know why i even have a theory on that because so often it runs against what that most of our sources of the all mainstream media are on the left but they can't not report what the report was this was the rep- so npr waits till the near end to drop the following bombshell I remember the guy's name, Smith. So whatever, I don't remember his first name. So Smith, the uh, the the person who directed this study for Pew, said, well, and it, that it does make a difference because overwhelmingly the nuns are active liberals and Democrats. <laughs> Big, we'll, we'll get back to that if we want. Bigger bombshell, one sentence and smith added that the uh the nuns were much less likely to volunteer time to help people than the religious ones folks are you ready to lose weight but not sure where to start so i'd like to tell you why i chose phd weight loss and nutrition First, Dr. Ashley Lucas has her PhD in chronic disease and sports nutrition. The program is completely science-based. The PhD program starts with nutrition and is a lot more than that. They know that 90% of permanent change comes from the mind, and they work on eliminating the reasons you gained the weight in the first place. There are no shortcuts, no pills, no injections, just solid science-based nutrition and behavior change. It's worked for me. It has worked for my colleagues, Seb Gorka and Mike Gallagher. If you are ready to lose weight for the last time, call 864-644-1900, 864-644-1900 to get started or online at myphdweightloss.com and do what I and so many others do and so many others did, in fact. And that's just make an appointment for your one-on-one consultation. It's free. Call today, 864-644-1900. One sentence on like the most important point you could possibly make. In other words, religious people are better than non-religious people as a general rule. There are always exceptions, but as a general rule, and it's there. Always behave better. Behave better, yes. Well, that's all that, that's what, that makes you better. Right. Not do you mean well. Everybody means well. So uh, it it was fascinating. My my rule is read to the end of the article. Yeah, Yeah. You don't know what you'll find. And, and th- there it was for you. R- religion, jaded people don't volunteer time. Well, you know what? I think I, I'm trying to focus on this idea of what is it about religion that makes you non-jaded jaded compared to uh, not having a religious life or worldview. And I think it's because at the center of religion, and by the way, I just want to say, Neither Dennis nor I are religious absolutists. You and I criticize the way that religion has been done all of the time. Right. So this is a generalization, but clearly... No, but we're truth seekers, and and these are truths. Right. And I think it's because at the center of religion is a loving, good God who will punish evil 
and reward goodness. Well, at the, at the center of, of, uh, of Jewish and Christian, uh, of, right. of the biblical religions. Right. Yeah, I just want to make that clear. And I think that precludes you from being jaded, because what are the the tentacles of jadedness there, you know, well, discouragement. Well, good God governs the universe is going to keep you from being jaded. Yes, because you know, right. you know, no matter how bad life gets or no matter how discouraged or disappointed or upset or you feel or how unfair you think something is, you know, at the center, there's, there's, there's like an ultimate uh, blank slate that will judge you based on, goodness and your goodness and will judge the those who are evil appropriately and that that's such a nice thing to have that because otherwise of course you become jaded if you don't think there's any ultimate justice or any ultimate uh, people right i would be jaded who's going to reward you for your goodness the bad don't suffer and the good do how does that not make you jaded and when you're jaded you all you kind of throw your hands in the air and you go well everything is crap anyways i might just wallow in my jadedness there's no hope or or just religion provides you with hope yes religion provides you with hope there is a model an australian model this was in the daily mail uh who apparently uh has written like 28 reasons or maybe i don't know 70 even i'm not joking i mean a vast number of reasons not to have not to have children Hmm. by the way that's jaded of course, that's it a is. perfect example. Not oh, I don't, I don't, I don't care if I get married. I don't want children. That's jaded. Look at what they're doing in Israel. I mean, if there's any people who might feel, you know, jaded or feel scared about having children, it's the Israelis right now. Yeah. But they're, but they're. I was just reading this article that there are all of these kind of like shotgun marriages that are happening in Israel where people are getting oh, married now? and they're wa- yeah, and they're oh, wanting to have kids oh. because they're realizing. Talk about civilization oh, builders. Oh, is that interesting? They're, yeah. Uh, one, I was going to say her name, but one of the our Shabbat dinner uh, people, the one who makes the challah, <laughs> sent it to me. Really? <laughs> yeah, I told Send me about it to this. Me. Yeah, I will. How how these the, these Israel marriage has gone yeah, up because th- people. This are... is such a Jewish. Uh, these, are, <laughs> these are secular Jews, not just religious Jews in Israel. You're talking about. Yeah. It's such a Jewish response. <laughs> Things are bad. It's beautiful. Have a baby. It's really beautiful. I yeah. mean, if they, if it's if, the opposite of, of what we're doing. Well, oh, they, oh, climate change. That's what Don't I was have a baby. Say. They're having babies. I as assure Hamas. you, Hamas is a bigger threat than <laughs> yes. climate change. Yes, it, it is. You know, sometimes Dennis, I, I, um, I have a slight concern that we talk about God and religion too much on this show. I have no such concern. I know you don't. Well. <laughs> I, I, the reason why I said slight concern no, is no, because... No, no, no. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just no, saying I don't. I know. But the reason why I said slight is because, uh, A, I know that... we. I mean, we've gone weeks where we don't. We we do yes, full episodes exactly. where we don't ever yeah. say the word God or religion. And also, even if we do every week do that, this, people need more of this. That's but true. but anyway, I, I was... Sometimes I think, like, do we talk about God and religion too much? But I really think it's the basis of everything what i said a few moments ago and you are just a happier more principled healthier person when you pursue this than if you don't that doesn't mean it can't be done wrong of course it can be done wrong and of course that means you know it doesn't mean that some religious people aren't bad boilerplate i acknowledge my white privilege and that we're probably on indigenous land like you have to put right you know all of the the disclaimers through um but, like, think about, I mean, I think about this a lot with with this show and, and with Timeless. You know, sometimes when I say things that I know are going to get me in trouble or going to be deemed as controversial or may just, you know, you, you get it. When you say things that you know aren't going to go over well, I think about God. And I think about, okay, well, God's judging me. These people who are listening, Hmm. if they hate me, they're not judging me. And if God knows that this is true and this is good, that's it's like God is a shield for you, you know? And I I can't tell you how empowering of a feeling that is. And that that pushes me and makes me braver to to go to places that I otherwise wouldn't have gone to if I didn't have that belief. 
and I, I think a, a lot of what we're seeing now is so interconnected. I think the un, unhappiness and the, the high rates of suicide and depression come from the fact that, that we have a, a, a God-sized hole in our society, as Pascal would say. I think these radical race and gender laws and theories come from that. Everything goes back to it. I mean, that's your that's your whole theory, that, that a lot of what we're seeing is the consequences of secularism. Oh, that's my... That's my whole, uh, Sean has a point. He, he thinks, go ahead, he, he thinks it's related to baseball in some way. Go ahead. I was joking about that. Yeah. When you grow up in religion, God is the center of the universe and not you, I'm repeating, which keeps you from being self-centered and a victim and jaded. I think that is true. I, I agree. It also, yes, it, I mean... I, if you believe so deeply in the existential threat of climate change, existential means threat to the existence of, which is what right. they're taught. So you're, you're, you're 15 years old, 20 years old. You, you believe that you have no future. You, you will be essentially incinerated by, by heat. Uh, versus the, uh, the, the religious kid who is thinking, you know, uh, it's hard for me to believe, not because God will protect us from from climate change, but it's hard for me to believe that uh, I will give up on life because of climate change. Again, I'll have a child. I will still get married. They don't, though. One of the most I think the most important hour of radio I did in, in the last last year was about a piece in the New York Times, opinion piece, don't, about not having children because of climate change. And what was important were the comments. I told you, I always read comments. <laughs> and you can't comment in the New York Times and many places unless you're a subscriber. So all the comments were from subscribers. Not only do I look at them, I don't look at all of them. There must have been 3,000 comments, literally. But I, I check off, in, their, in the New York Times case, readers pick. In other words, the ones that oh. readers said are the best comments. I oh. always go in that order. It's a good tip. Oh, yes, it's a very good one. Then I know what everybody at the New York Times liked. Right. And one after another, you know what it was? Well... You know, my daughter is not having kids because of climate change. Ugh. I can't tell you how much I have wanted grandchildren, mm. but I support her. That was what me or my son, that was what almost every single one of the early, the top most popular comments were. I support my child's decision not to have a child. That isn't cynical. That isn't jaded. The world is so sucks that I won't have. I support my child's decision not to have a child. Mm -hmm. And 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 the religious per person looks. What are you out of your mind? Yeah, well, and by the way, the answer is yes. They are out of their minds. Just for the record. You know, there's there's a huge epidemic of demoralization. That's right. Where that's a great line. Where the epidemic of demoralization. I think you should write a column on that. I'm not kidding. Thank you. Here, yeah, that's a good. Yes, that's a good. It's a very idea. It, it, I would go further. It's a pandemic. Do you want to explain the difference? Yes. Between epidemic oh, epidemic and is pandemic? localized. Pandemic yes. is worldwide. And 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 this is worldwide. Well, I. Well, yeah, that's true. It is worldwide. But I I I, I would focus more on the United States. That's but fine. I, I hear you. No, no, no. I, I, I. It doesn't matter if you call right. it epidemic or pandemic. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, climate, people being fearful of their future, not having kids is of, because of climate change is one example. Another example that fascinates me is that people still use TikTok, even though it is widely known that the Chinese Communist Party is behind it and spying on us and stealing our data. And that that is scary because that shows that we... Like the the, chi the the CCP doesn't even have to hide that it's spying on us and that it's infiltrating into our culture. 
They know they do it right in front of our faces, what, and they so, and know that we don't this care. In relation to what? To demoralization. They know that we are so demoralized, and they know that we're so jaded and we're so out to lunch that they can literally in front of our faces spy on us, and we don't care. We don't care. Like when pe- like I'll see this. You know, when when the stuff came out about Joe Biden and the Hunter Biden emails, where it was found that several foreign nationals connected with authoritarian governments, including the CCP, gave millions of dollars to Hunter Biden, which was then uh, you know given to other Biden family members, and then that whole line ten percent to the big guy. There's evidence that it went to Joe Biden. There's all this evidence that they have taken bribes from foreign governments and. And nationals and people just don't care like they they literally like i'll tell it to people and they'll be like oh yeah well that's bad but like you know I, i'm sure that happens a lot it's like where's your fire you know like i'll talk to people and i'll be like you know the chinese communist party is stealing your i uh i think it was joe rogan went through the terms and conditions of of, of tiktok and it was like they they take they can get into your camera they take your file names they can get access to your financial records people know this and they don't care they're demoralized. They don't like I'll talk to people about the gender neutral toy thing and I'll go, doesn't it bother you that the government is now con- trying to control? I mean, they're not trying is controlling private businesses and telling them what to do and that they're pushing all this radicalism on children. And you get this zombie like zombie like resigned answer. And I read this article by Yuri Bezmenov who, or I think it was someone summarizing Yuri Bezmenov. He was that KGB defector who talked about- In the 1980s? In the 1980s, and I think he he lived in Canada. Um, Sean, can you look him up, Yuri Bez, Bezmenov? I think it, he defected and he, he lived in Canada. But Sean, he, B-E-Z-W-Q-T-R-N-I-Z-T. He wants me to know that while I was messing with him, he typed it correctly. Good. That's an achievement. He, that was an achievement. Canada, it, right? KGB? Yep. Okay. So every maybe I'll send the article and have Sean link it in the description, but it's this article where Yuri Bezmenov is exposing the Soviet Union's plan right. to... D- to and infiltrate the United he States. Has come true. Everything he says has come true. And the final step is demoralization. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're in now, where the population doesn't care mm-hmm. that their civilization, their country is going to crap. They just wallow in it and and they they just take it. I don't boy, now that you mention demoralization in that context. Mm-hmm. I ask on my show regularly, how do people in San Francisco or Chicago stepping over fecal matter yes. keep voting Democrat? It's, it is this demoralization. And, and the answer is they don't think anything matters. Yes. I mean, you, to watch your, these are beautiful cities, to watch your city become literally an s-hole, literally and you're you're not angry that that's jaded and demoralized so i now i understand where you were going with this that people that's, don't care that's a, yeah that's a very interesting and frightening thought i i mean i will where, where is your forgive me it, it, but dennis prager here with a man i have come to admire for his work so when i asked him what do you do This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. Where is your anger? And then you realize uh, their anger is at those of us who point it out. Yeah. That's and why is that? Because... They want to live in in the catatonic. Sorry. In biz.
<laughs> they they want to live in bleep. No, no. They, they don't want to live in it. They want to live without caring about it. They don't want, people don't want to be bothered by bad. They're prepared to be bothered by the anti-bad. This, this is a theme of my whole life. I, it's, it, this is what it was. The people on both liberal and left, they weren't anti-communist. Liberals were more so. They were anti-communist. I, uh, but leftists, of course, were pro-communist. But the, as when, when I was already young, uh, liberals being anti-communist was true for some period of time. But already in my younger days, they became not so much anti-communist, which is as noble as anti-Nazi, but they they became anti anti communist. Uh, interesting. That's very really, interesting. Really, this is very important. Yes, yeah. just like what I said about San Francisco. Or sure, they're not angry at their mayors. They're not angry at the party is one hundred percent responsible for it. They're angry at those who pointed out. Okay, I'm so with you because objectively it is true. You know, when people like, I, I have been, you know, called names because I'm against gender affirming care for minors. And it's like, wait a minute, you're not angry that they're trying to trans the kids. You're angry at me for That's trying to, right. for telling you That's that, they're, correct. that they're trying to now, trans the kids. You got it as usual. I, I, yes. I got it, but I want to get it more. That's, it's clearly happening. But my question is why? Why you said they don't. People something... want to ignore evil. But it, but so, what if they're but the, the thing I don't get forgive yes. me is you're you're living in a city where you are look your right. people what, matters getting on your it's affecting right. you yeah well so, it, it would have to affect them in such a way so deeply yeah that's true no pun intended that uh, they 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 couldn't any longer ignore it but by that time it's too late hmm. it's like we 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 don't want to be bothered by uh, by Lenin or by Stalin. And then they come and knocking on your door and take you to the gulag. It's too late. That or that was the great line. Or Solzhenitsyn. Of, no, no, not Solzhenitsyn's line. Maybe he had one similar. But the great line of the pastor, uh, um, uh, was it Niemöller? Who? Uh, there were two f- uh, really famous pastors uh, in the Nazi era. Who? Who was the one that? Uh, uh, Eric Metaxas wrote the Bonhoeffer. B- Bonhoeffer, right? Thank you. It wasn't Bonhoeffer, it was Niemöller, correct, okay. Pastor Niemöller is the author, he was a German pastor, and he, I'm paraphrasing, but this is essentially what he said. First they came after the communists. I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. Then they came after the labor unions. I wasn't in a labor union, I didn't say anything. Then they came after the Jews. I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't say anything. Then they came after me, and there was nobody left to speak out for me. Hmm. So, you know, the people don't want to confront evil. And I wrote a piece years ago. People could look it up on the Internet. I think the title was something to the effect, The Left Fights Statues, The Right Fights Evil. See, oh, so you you tore down a Thomas Jefferson statue. Biden, Biden just removed the the one in Arlington National Cemetery. The the I didn't the, know that. Yes, a month ago, I forget of what the whom? statue is called. Oh, oh okay. It was um, after the the Civil War, and it was a unity statue, and it and basically the inscription was, um, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but this is dedicated to people who fought for what they what they believed was right. Americans well, on both sides. Who- Lincoln's motto, what is it to, uh, it's the Reconciliation Memorial. Reconciliation. Okay, thank you. L- yes. What was Lincoln's motto? To, to, not to show, uh, uh, not hubris, but, um, oh, charity to- towards, towards all. Uh, that e- even if you fought for slavery, which is what the Southern f- f- fight was about, uh, let it let's just let us make a, a united states of america and and not bear ill will because we have to forge a, a good country and it's about alternative it's about weighing 
the two options, okay? In a perfect world, would I punish, you know, would, would Lincoln want to punish and have you know, malice? Rancor towards ju- none, I think that's what he said. Rancor, yeah, told, that, that is yeah. what he said. In a perfect world, would he probably want malice and punishment to be funneled at every person who supported the evil of slavery? Yes, but again, yeah, people don't get like, you can't create a perfect world. What What is what is going to work out best for the country? If we wallow in this... Or if we move on, and even when moving on requires giving a pass to some really terrible people, that is what he Maybe understood because he had wisdom. With your line, you can't create a perfect world. Well, uh, right. You know what I played on my show recently? Arguably the stupidest lyrics of any song ever written, at least in the English language. Imagine. Imagine. I knew you were going to say it. Well, of course you knew I was going to say it, because you probably agree. I do agree. Oh. Imagine uh, there's no heaven. No heaven, yes. Wait, I don't want to imagine there's no heaven. I want to imagine there is a heaven. It's beyond belief. No no hell. No hell hell below us, above us only sky. No hell is disturbing me. It's just nothing. It's disturbing to me is no heaven. I agree. Wait, so wait. So Hitler and Pol Pot don't don't go to hell? They, They... what do they have after life? Well, oh, and, and what about no countries? How's that? No, no religion countries. too. Nothing to no right. nothing to kill or die for. Yes. No really. So what is it? Nothing? Are we yes. all just like mashed potatoes? Isn't that jaded? Like, what is? Talk about jaded. Yeah. Well, boy, this demoralization. You thing. know, I'm reading through the New Testament. Yeah. I, I just read it through it every word again. Now I'm doing a lot of studying how, because how many how many Jews are doing right, that? Yes, religious <laughs> Jews at that. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'm going to be again participating with Jordan Peterson in Bible study. So we're going to be so cool. We're doing the, uh, the Gospels. We did Exodus. It's up at Daily Wire for those who want to watch it, and it's got millions of views, which is very heartening. So uh, uh, there's a line in the New Testament. It's it's got to be one of my favorites. Those who don't work won't eat. <laughs> I wish, you know, all, all these Christian liberals who, who, you know, who cite the the New Testament as to support the, their cockamamie views, in my opinion. Why don't they cite that one? Mm. You know, if you're healthy and you don't work, why should we feed you? And this, this did you did you know that that quote is in there? I didn't. Isn't that mind blowing? Mm. Well, where is it? In what? Oh, I don't. It's one of Paul's lines. I don't remember in, in one of the letters, but there, it's, you know, most of the New Testament is letters after the Gospels, except for Acts and Revelation. So, it's really uh, I I I I knew that line before, but when I came across it again, it, that's the way it should be. But we we in this bizarre notion. We'll feed you anyway. You you don't work, but we'll feed you. It's it's not you, you don't make a civilization that way. You and and the in, in a sense the the proverb in the Old Testament, spare the rod, spoil the child, is similar to what Paul says about about the uh, about not not eating if you don't work. The the realistic approach toward human nature produces much more goodness than this romanticized nonsense about human nature. Uh, yes, children have to be disciplined. That's what it means. Whether that it's meant literally, you know, you use a rod or not. And by the way, did you know this is really, that would be a fun subject for one of our uh, podcasts. I did a show a few times. This is why I love talk radio because I learn so much from people. I mean, there's no other possibility of my doing this if I didn't have a talk show. Raise an issue and have people from every background in life answer me. I mean, it's like a dream come true. So I asked if your parents, if your parent or parents, used corporal punishment on you. Oh. How do you regard that now? Oh gosh, is that interesting? What did they say? Every single caller said it was a good thing they did so. There wasn't one. Uh, now, uh, Get ready for a headline about you after uh, saying I, I, that. Well, after but, and by the way, this is a guy who didn't use it on his own kids. And right. I'm not sure I was right. I asked the question because I really wanted to to get an honest uh, answer. 
And now there are there obviously it could be overdone, but of course that's true. I'm right. not talking about beating of course, a child. Of course. But you know, a few whacks, I don't know, with a ruler, uh, that's what nuns were known for. Uh, or or uh, the the thing that I did say and still say, the issue is not physical punishment. The issue is humiliation. That's wrong. That's why no spanking, if that's what it is, should ever be done on a bare buttock. That's mm-hmm. humiliating. Well, that's degrading. That's degrade. That you and that. There's no dignity. That in you that. you have robbed yes. your child of dignity, and yes. that's bad. Yes. But uh, but uh, the so the hitting is not an issue. The, I, I, you know, people go. So what do they have today? A kid acts out. I mean, in a really bad way. Take a time out. So what, they retreat to their bedroom, which, which is like the museum of toys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gender I, I, neutral I, I've, toys. I've never, uh, yes, of course. I've mm-hmm. never understood why go to your room in the modern age is a punishment. Go to your room is a sort of reward. Well, I think for for people, it's like your parent. You know, it's more that you know your parents are upset with you and want to and are trying to give you yeah. time to reflect. Oh, uh, let, let's let's do that. Oh. We've run out of time, but I, that's worthy. I wonder how many kids even care if their parents are upset anymore. Oh, God, because, I cared so much. Oh, you did, It yes. was horrible when they uh, were upset uh, at me. Yes. It was the worst feeling in the uh, world. I don't know. if Parents are so not held in the same respect you held yours or I held mine. It, it, it's like telling people today the police are upset with you. That meant something for all of American history. It means nothing today. Because going back to this theme, nothing matters anymore. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do with the oh, absence of your God. Your feelings matter. Yes. I, what God teach? like, the thing I love about the Bible is they say you're created in the image and likeness of God. That is a beautiful statement. And it's really cool to to feel that in yourself. And, and also, yeah. as corny as it sounds, when I look at other people, I think that of them. I think that our individual decisions have consequence. They have consequence because someone is watching and someone is going to tally up at the end of your life all of what you did well and all of what you didn't do well and make a judgment. You literally believe that whether you like it or not, there is an ultimate purpose in life because you're going to be judged. And in the secular realm, you don't have any of that. What is what is your incentive to behave well? Why wouldn't you steal? Why wouldn't you be angry? Why well, wouldn't look, you wallow? Why, why gave, wouldn't you succumb that's to video why I games? That's gave the data on who volunteers more. And why wouldn't you be demor? Like, why would you care about crap on your street? Or why would you care? You just, you just have this. Well, whatever. I'm gonna die anyway, and then I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be out of here in, you know, fifty years. Anyway, and I, I don't live downtown. It'll be done, right? That's the point. I don't live, I don't live there, right? Well, Jules. Oh gosh, I have more I want to say, but this is, this is the problem, with Dennis and Julie. We always have more we want to say. Thank God. Right, that's true. It's on. It's it's the good thing about Dennis. All and Julie. right, tell him. I know what you're saying, but I why don't you, you do. say it? Because we Julie have. So, Julie we have so, I'll com. tell you. Wait, I want to answer her question. I don't say it because a you'll do. There's a, a tradition, job. and we're conservatives, B, and we love tradition. There's a tradition. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'll conserve the tradition. <laughs> Julie at julie is my email. Love hearing from you. You can also uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R Hartman. You can follow Dennis at the Dennis Prager on Instagram and Dennis Prager on Twitter. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh yeah, he's annoyed you didn't say shalom. Someone heard it.